but then I think we're going to have you as our as our initial speaker. Uh, because I am the oldest. No, I I had put a list together and I had Dave Deemer as first, and Dave hasn't appeared yet, and you were number two. So now you've moved up to number one. <clears throat> I'm not sure you're the oldest, Dave. <laughs> well, anyway, we won't go into that. <laughs> so. Um, let, let me just say, first of all, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, our, our next events will be in November. <clears throat> and I just want to remind you that <clears throat> Joel Premack will be giving the Emeriti Lecture. <clears throat> and that will be kind of at the usual time, 7 o'clock on the second Tuesday in November. That's the 10th. <clears throat> and then we'll have our, our usual November luncheon. So technical OK, and the, that November luncheon will be on the 12th. I'm just explaining why things are on. Oops. Okay. It has always been on the second Tuesday because normally we had a conflict with the Arboretum, but we're going to keep it on the second Tuesday on the 12th. And uh, Lindy Dean is going to be talking about Inca rock art, which should be really interesting. Yes. So, so this event uh, had been a little bit snake bitten. Uh, you know, the idea was an important part of our our luncheons is the schmoozing that we do an hour beforehand. And we say, hey, what are you working on? What's your project? And we, we get caught up on what our people are doing. And so an attempt to, to keep that going, uh, we've asked five people from the five different academic divisions to give a short talk. Uh, this would be challenged to get all five of them in there. I've told them that they should be short. Uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna see how it works. So we're gonna start with the humanities and start with Peter Kinez. So Peter, take it away here. Well, my title is The Gloom Years of Communism. And that the reason for that is because uh, this is the title of a manuscript, which I sent to the uh, publisher a couple of months ago, and uh, I'm still uh, waiting for readers' reports. Uh, it is a book, it is a manuscript um, which deals with uh, uh, what happened in Hungary between 1949 and 1956. This is the continuation of a, my earlier book, which uh, dealt with the establishment of the communist regime. Now, I do not expect that this is going to attract the crowds. I do not expect this is going to be a bestseller. I uh, imagine the interest in what happened in Hungary between uh, uh, 49 and 56, that is, between the establishment of the regime and the Hungarian revolution of 56 is limited. But I do have uh, some larger issues which I am discussing, namely, uh, how did a totalitarian regime was established? Uh, what were the characteristics? What is a totalitarian regime? Uh, this is the first part. And the second part, how did it disintegrate? And in the course of it, uh, I was interested in discussing how the Hungarian regime was similar and different from the other Eastern European regimes at the time. And I make a considerable point of the large participation of, of within the leadership of Jews. And uh, uh, some people have complained that by emphasizing the the, the large part of, uh, of Jews in the communist leadership, I actually uh, promote anti-Semitism thereby. But what can you do? I mean, this is a fact. Now, of course, we can explain why this was the case. And it is also true that most Jews were not communists and most communists were not Jews. But it is a fact that the top leaders uh, in the certainly uh, during the first part of the of this regime, were all Jews. I mean, the the top quartet, uh, Rakoshi, uh, Geru, Revoi, Farkas. These are names I'm sure don't mean a great deal to you, but they were all Jews. And indeed, in the Hungarian uh, regime, Hungarian communist regime of 1919, out of the 19 People's Commissars, there were 16 Jews. I mean, this is a phenomenon which uh, requires an explanation. And the explanation is, uh, is, is simple enough. Uh, namely, uh, uh, Jews were uh, greatly overrepresented in the intelligentsia, and the leadership uh, uh, emerged from the intelligentsia uh, on the one hand. 
On the other, it is also true that the Jews were attached to uh, the national and the nationalist myth of uh, the Hungarian uh, uh, regime to a lesser extent. And they looked to Marxism as, uh, as something which will allow us to rise above national prejudices and anti-Semitism will disappear and that sort of things. But uh, it is a phenomenon and this to a considerable extent uh, characterized the, the nature of the regime. And it's also undermined the legitimacy of the regime. And when I talk about why the revolution occurred in Hungary in 56, rather than in other of, of these communist countries, this was a, a, a fact, namely from the point of view of the, the average Hungarian, the regime was doubly alien. First of all, because it was imposed by Soviet arms. And second, because it was led by what they perceived as non-Hungarians. That is from the Hungarian point of view, Jews were not Hungarians. I mean, uh, now the poor Jews regarded themselves as uh, Hungarian Jews, but uh, not Jewish Hungarians. I mean, that's, uh, first of all, they thought of themselves as Hungarians, but that was not good enough. So uh, uh, the disintegration of the regime occurred uh, starting in 1953 with the death of Stalin, uh, which necessitated uh, uh, an introduction of reforms and undermined the legitimacy of the regime. But what particularly interested me is the character of the leaders. I mean, what kind of people were they? And uh, of course, one can make generalizations about them. And this, of course, goes beyond uh, uh, Hungary. I mean, one can make a generalization which goes beyond uh, communist leaders in the other Eastern European countries and indeed in the Soviet Union too. The first generalization is that all these people who were ultimately responsible for a rotten and suppressed and repressive regime uh, and there's no question about that. Uh, in 1952, for example, 5% of the population were in camps and in prisons. It, is a total, it was a, a repressive totalitarian regime which produced a low standard of living, national alienation, and above all, terror. So what are we to say about the people who were in position of leadership? Well, first of all, is that they joined the communist movement at a time when there was not the slightest chance that the communists would come into power. That is, nobody joined the regime because they wanted power. So uh, the first generalization I would make that, that these leaders were idealists in the sense that they were devoted to an idea and that idea uh, was different from fascism. I mean, the fascists established a reprehensive regime and the communists established a, 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 rep, a reprehensible regime. But the, the, the character of the leadership, those who were attracted to one idea, rather an ideology rather than another ideology, were thereby, were not motivated by similar, uh, uh, similar attraction. I mentioned that the uh, other characteristic of these leaders were disproportionately Jewish. Now within it, of course, they were very different from one another. I mean, some actually, most of them were actually quite well educated and intelligent. Uh, some of them were not. Some of them were more attractive people than others. Uh, and then when they were removed from power after 1956, actually none of them felt that they wanted to repudiate it what they believed in. That is a generalization which I would make that if you lead a totalitarian repressive regime and then the regime is, uh, is, is removed, you have a great deal of trouble saying that, well, I put my life in the course of a, of, for a cause which did not deserve it. People 
Now, if you are a writer, if you are an intellectual, you can say I've been wrong. But as a politician, when you were responsible for so much, which in retrospect clearly seems wrong, you cannot say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have. Really, it's a universal phenomenon. None of the, none of the Nazi leaders and none of the communist leaders ever afterwards said, well, I was mistaken. Mm. Well, uh, another generalization is that they lived in a bubble. They were totally cut off from what was happening in the rest of the country. And they continue to believe that the working classes are supporting us. But of course, this could not have been further from the truth. Well, I'm afraid that my 10 minutes is up. But uh, needless to say, I could go on and on and on and just, well, drone and drone, but perhaps that would be wrong. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you, Peter. And you've left uh, plenty of time for questions. So people have questions of Peter. So let's, uh, it's not such a huge group that we can't simply unmute ourselves, raise your hand or something, and I'll call on people. Uh, question for Peter. Well, let, let me ask one. Peter, just as a historian, how do you get this information about these people? It's, it's not obviously something that one could go to McHenry Library and dig up. Well, the, uh, what is remarkable is that, again, technology. I pay uh, 120 euros a year, and I have access to all Hungarian newspapers, journals, periodicals, uh, 19th and 20th century. And consequently, I can read what they were writing, and I can read what was written about them. And this is a major source. I also worked in the archives in Hungary in the good old days when uh, it was possible to hop on an airplane. Mm -hmm. um, when I say good old days, of course, I always mean it ironically. Okay. So, I mean, that's uh, the, the major source is some uh, autobiographies and then uh, uh, what, was, what was written about these people, and there is quite a lot. Okay, so Ruth Solomon, did you have a question? Yes, I want to ask, what's the title of your new book and when is it coming out? Um, we have uh, our closest friend is a Hungarian freedom fighter who came over in 56. And um, my husband, John, taught him English and he became uh, a major eye surgeon uh, and developed the cure for glaucoma. Um, he, he is now back in Hungary writing books and anti-government documents. I would love to send him the title of your new book. Uh, the book uh, is, I expect, I hope it will come out uh, by Cambridge because Cambridge published uh, the, it was a kind of uh, first volume. This is a continuation of a a, 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 a book which was published by Cambridge. I sent in the manuscript a couple of months ago and now it's in the hands of readers. And quite possibly uh, since I have become older, what I write is not as good as it used to be and who knows, they may repudiate it. I don't know, but it's out of my hands, uh, but it would come out, it would come out, it would come out by Cambridge. Uh, uh, I don't know when. Um, so the title really refers to these years. And apropos freedom fighter, the kind of freedom fighter I was in 1956, I was uh, uh, sitting in the cellar when the, the fighting started and I was reading Marx. Okay, all right, Piort, you had a question. Yes, were there any major differences between the individual countries of Eastern Europe in the period we are referring to or was it yes uniform? yes uh, one difference was that uh, uh, countries which had the slavic population they were not as anti-russian as the hungarians and the poles 
that is Bulgarians and Czechs to a lesser extent, uh, they were not as bitterly anti-Russian as the Hungarians. And as I mentioned before, the major difference was that the Hungarian regime, unlike all other Eastern European regime, was the leadership was dominated by Jews. And that very much undermined the legitimacy of the regime. And therefore it was very much hated by the population. But basically uh, the issue is nationalism was uh, was very significant in undermining the legitimacy of the regime. So um, all these regimes, of course, had a great deal in common. But um, uh, as the revolution in 56 demonstrated, the Hungarian regime was in worse shape than the others. OK, I'm going to take two more. I'll take Roger and Joel. So Roger, go ahead. You'll have to unmute yourself, Roger. Yeah. Um... Well, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, this is a talk where I really wanted to hear more. But uh, my question is, uh, <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, when I visited Hungary in the 1980s, when it was still communist, it was more liberal and had the reputation for being more liberal and open than the other countries, and certainly was more than Czechoslovakia and East Germany. Uh, it was could the, you comment on that? And is that correct? And, and uh, yes. why is that? It was called uh, the, the, the gayest camp in the, in the, the, the gayest uh, <clears throat> camp in the, in the, the group of, uh, of communist countries. Yes, indeed, after 1956, not after 56, but after 1960, it became one of the more livable places. The leadership completely changed, uh, and uh, the the character and personalities of the leaders actually mattered a great deal, and the regime which uh, Kadar established was uh, less oppressive. Uh, there was a greater degree of intellectual freedom, and movies which were made in the 70s, for example, are just uh, wonderful um, and uh, remarkably free. Uh, and we can watch them today with uh, a great pleasure. So it was a very different regime which existed after 1960 than what existed between 49 and 53, which were the worst years. These were the gloomiest years, so to speak. So yes, uh, the change was very significant. Now again, today, uh, it is again quite reprehensible regime, uh, the Orban regime and to me, uh, what is happening in Poland and what is happening in, in Hungary are really the least attractive regimes now in Eastern Europe. The explicit uh, repudiation of liberalism in the case of Poland and Hungary, uh, it makes them uh, uh, contrary to my taste and political commitments. Okay, so Joel, you've got the last question for Peter. Well, I was actually gonna ask uh, something along the lines of what you were just saying, Peter. Uh, I was going to ask what you think of the Viktor Orban regime and uh, the chances of Hungary uh, returning to some kind of uh, more liberal environment. And I also uh, wanted to hear what you thought of the attacks on George Soros, who's of course Hungarian and Jewish. Uh, and uh, does that reflect uh, this uh, history that you mentioned of the Jews leading uh, the uh, Soviet uh, domination of Hungary after World War II? Well, several things to be said. Today, Hungary has the largest Jewish population in Eastern Europe and one of the largest in Europe in general. Soros, as you know, is a, is a worldwide phenomenon and uh, um, as much uh, despised in, uh, in the right-wing circles in America as they are in Hungary. The particular irony of the situation is that Orban, actually studied at Oxford in the late uh, 1980s on Soros. With the scholarship from uh, Soros. That's right, that's right. Now all this, uh, now, uh, well, uh, the Soros stands for uh, globalism, stands for uh, uh, liberal uh, ideas, and Soros uh, created and financed uh, the Central European University, which was a wonderful institution. And Soros's goal was to uh, create uh, 
from um, ex-communist countries, a liberal intelligentsia, which would go home and establish uh, liberal regimes. It didn't quite work out because people who came uh, to uh, study in Budapest didn't want to go home. They went, rather they went to Western Europe rather than going back to Kyrgyzstan or Romania or what have you. But the, the intention was something uh, really admirable and it was a wonderful university with very high economic standards. I taught there as a visiting professor uh, for a year, which I greatly enjoyed, and I'm still in contact with many of my students. Okay, well, thank you very much, Peter. That was great. Uh, so now we're going to turn to uh, the engineering division and Dave Deemer. Dave, so you can unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Good. I'm going to go right to my shared slides. Mm -hmm. Click on it. I do what double click. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep, yeah, good. Okay, we're up and running. <clears throat> so I've had a 30 year adventure, which started when I was still at UC Davis and uh, is still going on right now as we speak. From academe to industry, evolution of an idea and lessons learned. So basically, I'm going to go through about a dozen lessons that I've learned in those 30 years. And uh, you're going to be quite surprised, as I was, at some of, some of these lessons. So I want to start out by just saying, how can an, an invention emerge from basic research? So I was doing, uh, long before I was doing nanopore sequencing of DNA, uh, I was interested in how to sequence, as a lot of people here at Santa Cruz were. Uh, and while I was still at UC Davis, uh, I was working on what we call synthetic life. And we were capturing enzymes in artificial membranes that could synthesize DNA if we could feed them. So the question is, how can we feed this artificial cell? So the idea was to insert a protein channel into the lipid bilayer, and that's the membrane that surrounded our little synthetic cell. The channel had to be big enough in the protein to let nucleotides in. And nucleotides are the monomers of uh, DNA. There's four of them in DNA, and you're going to learn about those as we go along. So how can I get those monomers in? So here's the experiment. How can we feed an artificial cell? Here's the cell. You can see this is microscopic, by the way. Uh, we see a polymerase enzyme that can make a nucleic acid but only if we put in energized substrates, such as ATP. Adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, is the energy source used by all life on the Earth, and it's represented by the little red spots there. So if I add a channel, and by the way, we did not know of any channels that would work at this time. Most channels were much too small to let ATP across the membrane, but we were just guessing. So we get that ATP inside, then the uh, polymerase could make some DNA. So that'd be great. But then something occurred to me. If I could put a voltage across the membrane, positive inside, negative outside, I might be able to pull a polymer of DNA into the cell, or at least across the membrane. So that was the idea. And that's lesson number one. If you look at the date on this, it's Sunday, June 25th, 1989. I was uh, driving from Eugene to join my family. They were on vacation in a little a resort called uh, Belknap Lodge. And I just dreaming about how to, how to do this. And this idea popped up. Maybe if I could have applied a voltage to a channel across a membrane, I could catch DNA on one side and pull it through to the other side and that's what you see in the little drawing uh, on the right. You see a channel, you see a piece of DNA moving through the channel with a positive charge on the right. And DNA, by the way, is negatively charged, so it's going to move from left to right. And the idea was as each base occupied that channel, we would see a different signal from it that was base specific. And that's just down at the lower right, you see uh, the uh, 
y-axis label I, that scientific uh, abbreviation for current, ionic current or electrical current. And then you see CGTNA, and those are the four bases of DNA. So C and G and TNA are all different. They've made different, different changes to the ionic current through the channel because we thought they were different sizes. So G and A are the biggest, and you see the biggest deviations, and C and T are the smallest. So that was the idea. It was a good thing, but I wrote it down because otherwise I would have had no record of this idea popping up on June 25th in 1989. So the next lesson is, is the idea valuable? Can it be patented? Well, you see now 10 years later when this curve starts in 2001, it cost a hundred million dollars to sequence a one human genome. By the way, the first human genome was put online by uh, Jim Kent and David Hausler right here at UC Santa Cruz. And the genome that they put online was started up around 1990 and it costs, the estimate is $3 billion for the first human genome to go online. But by uh, 10 years later, it was down to 100 million. Then you can see it go down by orders of magnitude. And right now it's hovering around $1,000 a genome. So yes, the idea is valuable. So we're going to patent it. So that's the next lesson. You better patent your idea or no companies are going to be interested in it. So in 1995, we applied through the Harvard Patent Office because one of my colleagues, Dan Branton, was working with me on this idea. And he was a Harvard uh, uh, faculty member uh, in their biology department. And by the way, he was my postdoctoral advisor when I was at UC Berkeley for my postdoctoral research. Uh, Dan went to the Harvard office and lo and behold, George Church had had a similar idea. So we got together and said, but we don't know if this is going to work, so let's just share uh, the inventorship on the patent. And therefore, you can see Church, Deemer, and Brandon as the inventors at that time. So everything else is what I'm going to tell you about in the rest of this talk. Lesson four, we got to test the idea. Well, I realized that there might be a channel available because I had a friend back east named John Kassianowicz, and he was talking about this channel at meetings that I would go to. It's called hemolysin. This is a toxic protein put out by Staphylococcus. And it's called hemolysin because if it gets into a red cell, the red cell grows up and pops. And that's called hemolysis. So this is named hemolysin. hemolysin. And you can see on the right, a single strand of DNA imposed on that channel and it fits, it's a very close fit. So the next video I'm gonna show you is DNA being pulled through the hemolysin channel. And this is uh, a video made up after we had got started on this research uh, by Alexei Aksimentiev at the University of Illinois uh, in Champaign-Urbana. So Alexei can do this kind of thing. He can make a molecular model, and this is a real molecular motion you're gonna see. And there's DNA, a single strand. It's sort of caught in the top part of the channel. And what you're gonna see is the motion of that DNA when I turn on the voltage. So here we go. So it's just sort of hovering around there and suddenly it begins to feel the voltage and watch what happens. It gets sucked through the channel from the negative side to the positive side. And the idea is that each base entering that channel might give a base-specific signal. Well, we got to license your patents because companies, you, you're not going to do this on your own as an academic. You need company help. So out of the blue, two people from Oxford Nanobor came to visit us in 2007. And their names are there, Gordon Sangera and Spike Wilcox. Gordon is still the CEO of the company and Spike Wilcox is the CFO. That's the chief executive officer and the chief financial officer, if you don't know that uh, jargon. So they were in Oxford. Uh, they had a, a, a colleague there, Hagen Bailey, who was a professor at the University of Oxford, and they wanted our patents. 
Well, usually we have to go chasing after company money, but they came to us and said, we want to license your patents. Okay, we said, <laughs> go to it. So they got the license. Well, lesson six, hemolysin doesn't work. You can see it on the right. And that stem has about 10 nucleotides in it. There's no way that we're going to see a single nucleotide in the hemolysin channel. So Jens, Jens Gunlock from the University of Washington came to visit us and he said, I'm interested in how to do nanopore stuff. So show me how. So we spent a week or so with him and his grad student. We showed him how to do this. He went back to Washington and got started working with uh, a colleague of his and they came up with the MSPA channel. And look at the sensing region. That's the area that the change in ionic current happens. Look how small it is. There's just two or three uh, bases in that channel compared to the 10 to a dozen in the hemolysin channel. And it worked. We got together with Jens uh, and uh, we began to collaborate on this problem. Lesson seven, it has to be slowed down. Without a break on the DNA, it goes through at 500,000 nucleotides per second. It really zips through. And there's no way that we're going to see a single nucleotide go through at that velocity. So Mark Akison had joined my lab by this time. Mark was my postdoc when he was at UC Davis. He went off to NIH to begin his career. And I wrote to him when I got my first grant in 1997. And Mark said, okay, I'm gonna to move to Santa Cruz and have fun with this amazing possibility. It's a big chance he came on soft money, uh, but it happened to have a happy ending. So Mark said, I'm gonna figure out how to slow it down. And he discovered the Phi-29 polymerase. That's a little protein that you can see off to the right. And it can bind a double strand of DNA that's been partially pulled into the channel and it can make DNA. And uh, clear at the right, you see a little arrow pointing up. That's a DNA strand being pulled up as the polymerase synthesizes more DNA from that single strand to make that double strand you see at the top. It goes through at 50 nucleotides per second, and we can see that. That gave us a paper in Nature Biotechnology. That's a cover article in April of 2012. And there you see the MSPA nanopore from the University of Washington and the Phi-29 polymerase working together and success. There is the first DNA sequence from a nanopore in April of 2012, it was published. So you can see the synthesis beginning and there's, this is a synthetic DNA that had a, that had a sequence that we put into it. So the sequence is ACT, or adenine, cytosine, thymine, and it repeats ACT, 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 and so forth. Then we threw a G into it, that's a guanine, in the middle to see what would happen. We sort of saw a little difference. Then it goes back to ACT, ACT, and those changes look very much like what I had sketched into my notebook in 1989. So we knew it worked and the company was also making it work. We went to a meeting and learned lesson eight to tell others about these results. At that same meeting, Clive Brown from Oxford Nanopore showed the first minion, which is a handheld device that will sequence DNA using this idea of pulling strands through a pore. So the people there, by the way, are Jens Gunlock, University of Washington on the left, in the white shirt is Mark Akison. Uh, there I am in the bluey shirt, and there's my colleague Dan Branton from Harvard. And we are enjoying this surge of pleasure, realizing that this was going to work with the help of the company. So companies can do things that academics can't. In all of our time, we had a single channel and a single strand going through it, one nanopore. The company built this. They had a hundred million pounds of investment capital. They had about a hundred employees and they could do things that we couldn't come close to doing. They put 2000 nanopores into that little sensor well. Do you see that on the left, a sensor well? 
that's got 2,000 nanophores. They're all pulling DNA through it, and it's all being watched on a little laptop computer that this plugs into. So the company had to find a better nanopore. We knew that hemolysin wouldn't work, and we knew that MSPA we could not use because it had been licensed from the University of Washington by Illumina. Illumina is the biggest sequencing company in the world, and they wanted to get into nanopore sequencing. So we had to find a new channel, and Clive Brown directed the research for this. He was the chief technical officer at Oxford, and they found the CSSG, CSGC panel, uh, which again is a bacterial protein, and it works even better. They also had to find a better uh, way to slow it down. So they found an enzyme called a helicase. It just unwound a double strand of DNA and let the single strand go through. But now it was working at 500 bases per second. So it was working less than 12 advertise. Kate Rubens is an astronaut. She took a minion from Oxford Nanopore to the International Space Station in 2016. And there it is working. Down the lower left, you see what the minion looks like. And that computer screen is showing you the signal that comes out of the minion. Those, that's a, that is DNA going through 2,000 channels one at a time. And it is being sequenced in microgravity. By the way, Kate Rubens just flew back to the space station a couple of days ago with a couple of Russians. And she's up there now doing more work. And that was the last flight that we will make with the Russians because we're gonna have our own way to get to the space station. So here's the last lesson. When small companies invent disruptive technologies like nanopore sequencing, big companies sue. Mm -hmm. So Oxford Nanopore was sued by Illumina. They claimed that we were pa doing patent infringement because they they said, and they had no reason to believe this, by the way, they said that we were using that MSPA pore that they had licensed from University of Washington. Clive said, nope, we're okay. We've got our own pore. And that patent was settled a year or two later. Then we had another lawsuit just mm -hmm. two years ago. And this time it was PacBio. And they sued Oxford Nanopore again for patent infringement. By the way, this lesson is that when you get up into billion dollar companies uh, competing with each other, they can hire lawyers and they can slow down the advancing progress of other competing companies by filing lawsuits like this. Last year, Mark Akison was an expert witness on the jury trial and the jury ruled unanimously in favor of Oxford Nanopore. So that was it. Oxford Nanopore technology has survived multiple lawsuits. They're prospering. Their next instrument is called the Lampore. It's designed spe specifically for the COVID virus and it is working. We think that we might be among the first researchers in the US to test the advice. So that's my story and I'm happy to take some questions if there's any time left. Okay, probably time for a couple of questions. A uh, couple of questions for Dave, anybody? See any hands go up there? Roger, uh, unmute. Yeah, I, I actually had two questions. Um, one is, uh, what is the advantage of uh, the zero gravity in the space station for this process? I, I didn't follow that. And the, sure. and the second question, uh, just... Oh. Hmm. Uh, we lost your second question, Roger. I'll answer the first question in the break. Yeah. Uh, there, the inside of the space station is coated with bacterial and fungus spores. Mm -hmm. We've had people up there for dozens of years and we are worried that there might be a mutation in one of those bacteria and produce a pathogenic organism. The minion 
up there will tell us which organism that is, and then appropriate steps can be made. There is no other way to know what that organism might be than the than nanopore sequencing. Okay. Uh, other question? Okay. All right. Um, uh, let's see. Virginia, did you have a question? Uh, unmute yourself. Okay. Um, so when you get all these lawsuits, uh, you said it did slow you down, I can imagine. But where do you get the money to pay all the lawyers? <laughs> well, uh, you get that from the investors who invested hundreds of millions of pounds, in this case, into Oxford Nanopore. Uh, as a result of having hundreds of millions, you can afford a couple million to go after you know, a legal case. And that's really exactly what happens. And these are expensive lawsuits. Uh, Oxford Nanopore took two years fighting against the original Illumina lawsuit. The other lawsuit was settled in about a year, the PAC Bio lawsuit. So they have a pot of money and it's set aside for legal problems like uh, patent infringement. Yeah. I, okay. Could you, say, could you say that it uh, was a illegal lawsuit? I've forgotten the proper term there. And, you know, ask for punitive damages or something? No, it didn't work that way. Uh, all that happened finally, at least in uh, the PAC, yeah, in the uh, PAC bio lawsuit, that the jury decided that the patents that PAC bio said were infringing, in fact, were not. Uh, their patents were invalid, according to the jury. Uh, so the infringement simply evaporated because we won unanimously. Okay, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on in our ambitious program here. Right. So Linda Berman Hall, you are next up. You have to stop sharing. I just have to mute. Yeah. And you're muted, Linda. Oh, yeah. Unmute yourself on the bottom left-hand corner. Mute and... Okay. Okay. Go back, and now I have to find my screen sharing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Put your cursor over your screen and the green box should show up in the bottom middle. Sure. You finding it? Um, I'm sorry, I have to find my I have to find my view of the Zoom yeah. now. <laughs> okay. I'm joining the meeting again. Oh, you're, but you're, you're in. We're, we're seeing you. Oh, good. I'm delighted about that. <laughs> but I have to find you again on my screen. Well, so on, on the bottom in the middle, should be the little green box that's I could just see you if I could just see you again. Your screen. Oh, I see. I, I'm apparently I'm paused. Let's see. All right. No, it's not working. Uh, I touched the wrong thing because I touched my actual presentation. We can hear you. Oh, oh! Do you do you see a, the, there's a little blue icon that says Zoom? It should be in the dock in your computer. If you click on Zoom, it'll take you back to the Zoom view. Do you see the little blue with the little icon of a little video camera? Yes, I'm clicking all of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we can hear you. Yeah. Linda, we can hear you. I know that. All right, but you're not seeing the Zoom screen, you're saying. I'm simply not seeing the Zoom screen any longer. Um, also, just try hitting escape, because sometimes if you have... I've hit it three times. Okay. <laughs> okay.
Well, maybe what we'll do is we'll move on to Jim and yeah. then you can work on that. Okay, so Jim Gill, let's, let's move on to you, Jim. Okay, and you'll need to unmute yourself also. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Yep. It's good. Okay. That's good. So uh, I was the, the islands that Linda is going to talk about are of interest to me as well because they are near several several of the largest earthquakes on Earth in the last sixteen years. Uh, magnitude 9.2 Christmas 2004 and several since with big tsunamis. And there are also a few hundred kilometers from Lake Toba on Sumatra, site of the largest volcanic eruption on Earth in the last 75,000 years. So I'm going to uh, start with the physical sciences and she can shift to the arts. But I'll tell you four personal stories to illustrate a scientific discovery during the last 30 years in which I've <coughs> played an active role. Uh, the discovery is that underwater volcanic eruptions can be almost as explosive as those on land. So think about images that you've seen of uh, Mount St. Helens or Krakatoa erupting. Uh, a, ash thousands of feet into the air in a mushroom cloud like an atomic bomb. So we're coming to understand that undersea eruptions can be somewhat similar to that. Uh, a totally submarine eruption cloud can't be as high as those on land because the oceans aren't deep enough. And the submarine volcanoes and their eruptions are not as big, but they can be comparably explosive. For years, I, I and other people taught students the conventional wisdom that that was impossible. The red stuff that comes out of a volcano is called magma, uh, and it contains gas that's dissolved in the magma at high pressure inside the earth, but comes out of solution as bubbles as the magma ascends. Oh, it's the same process as for a carbonated beverage. Screen, what I touched was... The, uh, the CO2 in a can yes. or keg of beer is dissolved in the liquid under pressure, but comes out when the can is open or when the draft comes out of the keg. And magma can foam like the top of a Guinness beer in glass, but the magma foam can explode. And that's what happened at Mount St. Helens or at Krakatoa, and it's the greatest volcanic hazard. So we used to think that the weight of the ocean prevented magmatic foaming, much less exploding, deeper than about 500 meters. That belief was based on inferences from on-land geology and samples dredged from the seafloor and is still taught in textbooks, but it's wrong. So that picture in the upper left is from my most recent oceanographic expedition on a German ship three years ago uh, after I had been retired already for seven years. It was to the ocean north of New Zealand. We worked 24-7 for six weeks, mostly using the sampling method shown there in the top left, uh, this thing. So that's a dredge. It's a metal box down here with sharp teeth, and it's attached to a, a chain link bag. And it's dragged uh, behind the ship across the floor of the ocean and picks up any rocks that it finds along the way. And that's how it, things have been done for 150 years or more. Anything smaller than a few centimeters falls out through that chain link fence as it's brought back to the ship. So it can only collect big rocks like the one that I'm holding down here in the bottom left. Uh, that lava, the one I'm holding, came from this volcano in the upper right. Uh, it's one that New Zealand scientists discovered a decade ago 
and named for me. And some of you know my wife, Catherine, and daughter, Emily, and, and family who came down to the ship to see me off. So this slide shows newer sampling methods. The top left is a manned submarine called Alvin that I've used to dive into underwater volcanoes. And the top right is an unmanned robot that I've used for the same purpose. And in both cases, the, you, we use the robotic arms to collect samples uh, from accurately known locations on the seafloor. This is the uh, command room where the robot is controlled from. And the bottom right photograph is a ship used for scientific drilling into the seafloor. Our fellow emeriti Bob Garrison, Casey Moore, Eli Silver, and I have all used that ship. And the, the figure on the left is a photograph of a drill core from using that ship. It's from more than a mile below the seafloor, a few hundred kilometers south of Tokyo, where we drilled 31 years ago. At that depth, we expected all the volcanic rocks to be dense lava, like the one I was holding in the picture a minute ago. Here, the field of view is about one centimeter wide and two centimeters high. And if you, could, if you can see my cursor, this is filled with little bubbles. They're not as nanopore-ish as Dave's, but they're millimeters uh, in, say, one millimeter down to uh, tens of micromillimeters in diameter. So it's quenched bubbles. There's some yellow things like the one the cursor is on right now here. Those are crystals. The black stuff up here at the top left or all scattered through is volcanic glass. And over here on the far right is an actual fragment of lava. And they're all cemented together. We found about 135 meters of that stuff. And it was unlike anything that we had ever seen or read about. We had been at sea about a month at that point, and we were hungry for good food. Mm -hmm. So I called that deposit a chocolate mousse, mm -hmm. and we interpreted it as fossil foam, like what's on top of the Guinness beer. That is the product of a volcanic eruption about a mile deep, and each small piece of mousse turned out to be differently magnetized, indicating that it quenched randomly up in the water column before settling back down to the seafloor, thereby confirming explosivity. And that multidisciplinary conclusion was sufficiently bold and exotic that it, like Dave's, wound up as a cover story in a major journal, in this case, Science Magazine, with me as lead author. The top right photograph with that little red stuff in it is from my third story. In November of 2007, a NOAA oceanographic ship was transiting from Fiji to Samoa between expeditions. And along the way, they discovered serendipitously unusually turbid water and free hydrogen ions at a depth of about a thousand meters in the ocean. That combination of stuff usually coincides with an active volcanic eruption. So they called me from the ship because I know that area pretty well. I plotted the coordinates and I found that Russians previously had discovered unusual volcanic rocks about there that are scientifically important but were unknown from any active volcano. We wrote a proposal to the NSF to take a ship back there as soon as possible. The proposal got positive reviews in record time, and it became one of those so-called shovel-ready projects funded by the stimulus package in the early Obama administration. Six months after the serendipitous discovery, 
a robotic submersible was deployed at those coordinates and took that photograph. I couldn't go because I wasn't retired. <laughs> so I was still teaching, but I got daily updates from the ship that I reported to my class. So if I can get this to work. Here we go. This is a slow motion photograph or video that that picture I showed you a minute ago was taken from. This is what they saw at 1,200 meters below sea level on that very first dive. It shows meter diameter magma bubbles rising from the sea floor and then imploding to create the froth that becomes the moose. The reason for the undersea explosions turned out to be the same as for on land ones, namely um, water dissolved in the magma rather than CO2 in the beer. The water gets dragged back into the earth where tectonic plates converge in the process called subduction. My final story comes from another drilling project that I participated in six years ago, about 13 kilometers from the top of a large submarine volcano. We drilled into the seafloor almost two kilometers and we found only mud. And that was a bummer for all of us. We had hoped for things at least as big as what I just showed you. When I came back to UCSC, I studied the mud using an electron microscope in the School of Engineering and found that it was mostly very fine, tens of micron uh, length, submarine ash at about the same grain size as the stuff that erupted from Mount St. Helens. That muddy ash was about 80% of the volcanic output of the area where we drilled, similar to what's in the Cascades. The big volcanoes are obvious, but most of the material flux in the Cascades is ash. And it turns out the same is true in the ocean. It's ubiquitous but nobody had ever wanted to or been able to collect the ash before. So all of that, of course, is a brief kind of superficial introduction to a major research area. If you're at all interested in that kind of stuff, uh, volcanism and its role in the history of the earth, I refer you to this rather longer emeritus lecture on our organization's website, thanks to Todd Whipke. Oh, and that URL is there at the bottom if you want to follow up. So again, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, excellent, Jim. So is this happening off Hawaii right now? Um, south of the big island of Hawaii, there is an underwater volcano. It's about 1500 meters below the surface. So uh, yes, it's happening but it's kind of hard to see without, you can't scuba dive that way. Uh, but it's also different because Hawaiian volcanoes don't have the water content that the circumpacific ring of fire or ring of explosions does. So it happens, but it produces bigger things, bigger, bigger pieces in the eruption and far less uh, maybe a million times proportionally less fragmental material. Hawaii indeed is mostly lava, a little bit of ash, whereas the Circum Pacific is the opposite. Okay, other questions for Jim. Uh, let's see, we got David Koo, and unmute yourself. Hey Jim, I didn't quite catch, what was the error in the original thinking that sort of got changed? What was the physical process or whatever that 
made all of what you found, I guess, uh, new and you know, exciting because it was unexpected. I didn't quite catch that, sorry. Well, and I didn't address it. So, no. but it's, it's the same answer, David, as to Barry. Most of the geological inferences that we have had had come from places, uh, deposits that had been formed in places like Hawaii or observations made in places like that is called Loihi, south of the Big Island, or at mid-ocean ridges. So different tectonic environments where the gas that's in the magma is carbon dioxide. And there's mm, maybe a few tenths, one or two tenths of a weight percent of the CO2 gas. In contrast, those ones I was showing you came from near Japan where it's water, not CO2, and it's several weight percent, three, four, five weight percent water. There's a lot more explosive potential dissolved in that kind of magma, and no one had ever uh, witnessed the consequence. It seems a bit odd that you're under the ocean, these things are under the ocean. You would think that the water one would totally outnumber the one that was just CO2, I would think. And therefore, why was it so rare that you guys didn't see these before? So in this, if you think again of plate tectonics and the, and the globe, you've got these plates on the surface. So Hawaii is poking through one or they're being created in the Atlantic where the plates are falling apart. And they sit under the ocean all that time and they soak in the ocean water. And then you push them back into the earth through this process of subduction where the plate is destroyed. And underneath these places I was in the Western Pacific, that plate is now about 100 kilometers down. And that pressure of being pushed back 100 kilometers into the earth is too much for the water. And the water is lost from the plate, ascends, and winds up when, the mag when what's above it melts, all that water goes into the melt, it's transported up to the surface, it's happy inside, until a few kilometers depth, and then the pressure is so low, it foams. Thank so you. it's 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 the subduction of the water that's the key for the explosivity. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jim. So I think we're gonna try and keep on schedule. So we're gonna go back to Linda, who I think has solved her problem, Linda. Yes, that's right. And let's try now again, sharing the screen and... Good. Let's see. So, welcome to Sibirut Island, Pentawe. And imagine a place where apes are paramount. <coughs> and you see. <coughs> the gibbon of Mentawe, and this is the Mentawe below. You see him on your screen. Imagine that humans in this place carve statues of a guardian ape, <coughs> so ape sleeping in their clan house with their statue guarding the women and children. Imagine that the Bilo has been guarding the rainforest for half a million years long before humans arrived, looking down from 200 feet up in the rainforest canopy of wild fig-like trees. Whenever a hunting animal startled the below, its warning cry was so loud that all over the jungle, hunting was ruined for the entire day. Now that humans are the hunters, if a gibbon sees them, Humans will fail since the Bilo warns the whole jungle. Imagine the Bilo is still considered the guardian of the forest and that anyone who disrespects the forest will be punished by illness. Imagine that your tribal shamans who also study herbal medicine and ritual for years will sing a large repertoire of songs in an antique language, something like Latin for us, about the below. Turn that down. Right here, very well. 
And then, well, it's the next one, and particularly one too. Okay. And consider that a young boy became the first below, and in turn, that this young below became the first shaman. Imagine a place where if you get sick, the shaman of your clan will take a trance journey with his familiar to the world of the spirits to ask a below spirit how it is that you disturbed the forest and what to do to make it right so he can help you get well. Imagine that when you're old and ready to die, feeling comforted that when it is your time, your soul will literally ride the song of the below through the treetops to its correct place with other human souls in the world beyond. Actually, I've been visiting Mentaway shamans every year since 2011 until the pandemic. I've discovered Mentaway is the only place in the world where literally they take their spiritual cues from an ape. Now we see a topo map with the subduction zone just around Sipora and North Pagai. Um, the most significant of the many endemics are four primates and among them, it's the tailless gibbon ape that is central to this traditional animist culture. This map, by the way, has the villages that I've gone to for my work and the North Island Sibrut is where I've done my work that I'm talking about today. The Bilo is an elegant, small monogamous singing ape about the size of a house cat. Yes, it's this intriguing little ape that drew me to Mentaway the first time and has caused me repeatedly to return there. The biogeographical isolation of the archipelago has evolved a unique biotic community with nearly as many endemics as the Galapagos. DNA studies show that the Mentawayans, a distinct Austronesian hunter horticulturalist community are generally undiverse due to their long isolation. Their closest genetic relatives elsewhere are among the minority tribes of Taiwan and the Philippines. I work mainly with shamans who sing in an antique language. My informants are mostly in their 70s and 80s. In the mid 1950s, all Mentawayans were forcibly converted from animism to Christianity. Giant bonfires consumed shamanic regalia, herbal medicine boxes, and Bilo house carvings like this one. Carved sacred images of Bilo, a fundamental garden, guardian to the Mentaway people, were traditionally placed above the altar in the clan house. Yes, above the altar to protect the women and children. These were also burned in that time, but this one miraculously survived and is now in a museum. Only recently have shamans been allowed to openly resume practicing their animist spirituality, wearing traditional dress and curing with herbal medicines. Though in very remote areas like this one where I visited on a medical mission in 2012, sometimes they've never stopped. I've discovered that Mentaway is the only living culture where a primate is considered to bless, give spiritual direction and all around help to humans. Yet their habitat is shrinking and the numbers of all primates in Mentaway are lower every year. My plan is to bring the music I've recorded back to schools and cultural offices so these songs, dances, and stories can be preserved and pass on to future generations. And now let's listen to Aman Boroyogok, my favorite shaman. Well, I have many favorite shamans, but maybe this is the ultimate. Sing about how the below will guide the soul. Let me see if I can find it. 
we'll listen to part of his and maybe we'll see. She's what, she's the one who does the much who wants uh, those special music stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Okay. So we will go back here. All right. So he has an almost operatic voice. Yeah, he's wonderful. I've, I've gone to see him for three years in a row, actually. Always happy to see me. Questions for Linda. Jim, did you have a question? Do you, Linda, do you by any chance have on your computer the singing of the Bilu? <laughs> I am not able to play it right now, but I do have many, many examples. And the agreement I have with the person that I have all the recordings from, and they're from the uh, 60s and 70s, is that I must modify them in some way, maybe uh, one or 2% slower or one or 2% higher or lower with regard to pitch. And there are distinct differences between female and male song bouts. The male sings an hour or so before dawn. The female sings about an hour and a half or so after dawn or maybe even as late as 9.30 in the morning um, and has duet bouts with um, other females in surrounding fruit trees. Um, it is the male that guides the soul to other human souls. And when the male sings at a time that is not the characteristic before dawn time, that's when everyone knows someone must be dying in the village. How many Bilu are there now, do you know? Uh, nobody knows for sure, but they try to set up grids and do listening posts and then do a count. There are some tens of thousands in Sibirut because they have a wildlife reserve that is about half of the island. But unfortunately, whenever there's a giant wildlife uh, conference and everyone goes down to it and abandons their posts at the national park, that's when the timbering ships move in with their chainsaws. I hate to say it, Jim, but it's true. Okay, David, you had a question. Uh, thank you. Um, are the Bilu actually re so revered that they're not hunted at all by the humans or are they still considered food at some stage of their relationship? Well, I have heard of um, one household headed by a woman who is a widow and uh, with an air rifle, she has been known to hunt below because she's desperate. Uh, other than that, um, below is said to taste bad and nasty, unlike the other three 
endemic primates that taste rather delicious in varying degrees. Um, Bilau is not allowed to be eaten by shamans, of course, because they need them to help find out what's happened in the spiritual world when the forest has been disrespected by someone who's ill. Um, and in general, people will not hunt them, although the biologists that I have all my recordings of Bilo from, and I could get together with you, Jim, at a certain point and play some recordings so you would know. Um, I, have, I have composed on these and it's been in concerts, but I have to be very careful how I use them. I'm not allowed to scientifically publish them. Or you can go to um, the, um, the Gibbon Research Project, which is in um, Switzerland in Zurich, and you will find a couple of recordings there, but not really long ones. I have very extended recordings and they can, um, the song bouts can go on for an hour or so. And it's, it's quite amazing. And back in the 70s, there were a, a greater number of below at a greater remove from civilization. So you could hear it without the, the more likely motorcycle coming through the outback, which kind of tends to ruin it. Okay, well, well all right. I'm gonna, one last question from Faye and so um, all of these talks have been so great. How does one train to become a shaman there in Mentawi? Well, or women are not allowed to become shaman. So I'm not fully allowed to get an answer to all those questions, but it involves punen, which is a lot of fasting and a lot of time away from anyone that is related to you. And the wife has a huge role that might be compared to being a pastor's wife in our culture, that's to say, she has to go out and learn to dig the herbs that will be needed for the curing. Um, the role of studying as an apprentice with a senior shaman is very important and being available to learn for some years, setting the time aside in your life to be on the cycle of retreat and serious study um, is the most important of all. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Linda. That was thank very- Thank you, Barry. <laughs> all I right. I didn't expect that, I know. I didn't put anything about Gibbons <laughs> in my title. <laughs> wasn't a harpsichord in there, I couldn't- Well, I do two things and I always have. <laughs> okay. All right, so we go to our, our last talk, and this is uh, by Shelley Arrington. And Shelley is in Mexico, uh, and she is currently um, in a place that doesn't have a particularly good internet connection. So what she has done is to prepare a recording of her talk. And so with luck, here goes Shelley. Greetings all, I'm Shelley Arrington. I am a retired professor of anthropology and I'm in Mexico doing research on my new documentary film. Oh, I, I'm gonna stop that because- Find it. Oh, uh, just a second. Uh, what, what I've done here is I, uh, I have uh, the wrong, Shelley did two recordings is the answer. And this is the one she wanted. Yes. Good morning all, I'm Shelley Arrington. I'm a retired professor of anthropology. I've been to Mexico uh, twice this summer and fall in order to work on the pre-production for my new film, which is a documentary about uh, food in Michoacan. <coughs> In 2010, the uh, UNESCO declared Michoacan food to be uh, intangible heritage. And uh, there has been a boom in it in tourism and uh, for food. 
and it's a great help to the people in the Purepecha communities uh, who are still Purepecha speaking. I want to begin, before telling you about, really about the film and showing you some pictures, I'd like to begin with the first two minutes of my previous film so that you'll get a notion of the kind of thing that I'm up to. Let me begin here. Where is this? Oh, here we go. Let me see if I can do this. Yo sabía de antemano que me iba a dedicar a hacer cerámica, porque pues era, esa es la costumbre de la familia. Mi papá, él, él me enseñó y mi mamá, desde que yo tenía 17 años. Me da más emoción hacer piezas de esta calidad, hacer obras de arte. Para mí, poner este artículo de artesanía es como bajar desde de calidad. Es una actividad que poco a poco ha ido este, disminuyendo. Y pues necesitamos relevos, los hijos. Y es medio de trabajar en todo, en la estructura, en las tejidas. Pues Julia, ¿hiciste esto? So, for the uh, new film, I'm interested in several aspects of intangible heritage. Basically, the material basis of intangible heritage. Just a little interruption there, a few minutes. Um, I am, I'm interested in three aspects of intangible heritage. Uh, one is um, the way that bodies are trained. Another is the materials that they cook with, which are artisanal objects, just as the food uh, preparation is an artisanal object, and often there's quite a close connection between them. Uh, and then, of course, I'm interested in the ingredients, their temporality, uh, and uh, their, the fact that they are local. These things tie in with the movements on about fresh foods, farm to table, the kind of thing that Alice Waters has uh, created, and now many more people are interested in, especially with the pandemic crisis and the awareness of the importance of local foods. So let me just begin, or rather show you, a few of the characters that uh, we are meeting and taking pictures of. I did that wrong. Let me show you, first of all, where Michoacan is, which is to the west of Mexico City. It's a beautiful place, very fertile. And I'm doing work around Lake Pátzcuaro, uh, which was the uh, area, which was the, uh, the uh, capital 
as it were, of the Purépecha Empire. Here are some of the cocineras tradicionales. Here is, oops, let's go here. Here is uh, Benedicta, who is, well, you'll just see. <laughs> This is Rosario, who lives in uh, Santa Fe de la Laguna. I'd like you to look at her wonderful kitchen. The light is beautiful, and she has a tremendous amount of uh, clay pots and so on, uh, many of which she made. She came from a family of ceramists, ceramicists, and um, she makes her pots, but she's also become designated as a cocinera tradicional. Uh, here we are. There's a picture of my colleague, Jose Luis Reza, photographing her. And there's her husband in the corner taking a picture for Facebook. He is uh, quite a remarkable fellow. Uh, he has a Purépecha only radio station that comes on once or twice a week for a few hours. And because of the internet, he's able to reach everybody in the world, especially those who speak Purépecha. They're, of course, part of the Purépecha revival <coughs> of language movement and the uh, preservation of culture. You can see that they make not just... Um, in fact, they don't make very much of just the ordinary uh, clay pots. They are making art pots. This is Rosalba Morales. Who is, she lives in San Jerónimo. This is Rosalba. Morales, who lives in San Jerónimo. She is a remarkable person who has uh, been to the United States as an illegal worker in both kitchens and in agriculture. She sent back money, as many people do, and was able to have a house built. Uh, and then she returned and uh, rediscovered her uh, on uh, culture. She likes it a lot better. One of the things that she did not like about working in the U.S., aside from the tremendous hours in the restaurant kitchens, was when she was working in agriculture, the insecticide, which uh, bothered her and gave her skin problems and respiratory problems. So when she came back, she was very delighted to have this wonderful new way to uh, earn a living and be recognized. And now she says, not only is she not illegal, they invite her, pay her way, and give her her visa. Uh, here she is in her kitchen. Uh, she is making a restaurant, so she... Uh, and stored her clay pots for the nuns. Uh, we took a, a chef and his partner He's a wonderful, uh, he has a wonderful restaurant in Pátzcuaro. So we filmed them having a dialogue about the importance of fresh food and seasonal food. Mm -hmm. And she taught him how to use a metate to grind corn. This is Rosario Vera. She lives in Capula, which is also extremely well known for making pots. In fact, practically, this is the type of design. This is industrial, not handmade. Well, not very handmade. 
but this is a design that's on so many uh, of the uh, ordinary cooking pots that you'll buy in Mexico. Here she is in her kitchen. And uh, this is her daughter, who is one of the artisans who makes these very uh, ordinary type of pots. She makes the plates and so forth for her mother uh, to use in presentation and when she serves people, indeed for anything else. This is a picture of her as we are leaving during the first visit that we made to her. We're very interested in ingredients, of course. Uh, the most important is corn, which has been nixtamalized, which is soaked in an alkaline solution overnight. It loosens the corn. Obviously, this is criollo corn, original corn, uh, not any kind of GMO corn, which there's a tremendous movement against in Mexico. Um, it is the basis of, well, it's the basis of Mexican cuisine. What you uh, definitely know it as, it's the basis of, is tortillas. But there's so many other things that they make with it. Um, in this lake region, charales are a big project product that everybody loves. And um, they French fry them and eat them with salsa. They clean them out. Uh, and it's like a particularly protein-filled oh, French fry. You can get, many of these cooks get things in their own communities. But there's also a barter market uh, where you can go. And fortunately, they will barter for money so that you can buy things as well. But the vast majority are from communities. They have extra of whatever, and they come and exchange it. One of the things that we especially are, uh, we, the, that we had an adventure about was looking for mushrooms. We went up into the hills and went with Rosario uh, and uh, at the end of the season and found a number. This is the kind of thing that we have done and will be doing of uh, seeing where people uh, collect things, harvest, uh, and fish. After returning to her place, she served us uh, corn and as an appetizer. <clears throat> Jose Luis dusted off his uh, camera. And I admired the pattern of smoke coming through the shaft of light in her kitchen. So I know that you want to know how I take care of myself. <laughs> One is by stretching and doing my morning exercise. I also walk most every place. I eat wholesomely. And above all, wear a mask when you are outside and with, in public. That's it, folks. OK, so I guess if you, if you have any questions for Shelly, you're going to have to send it by email. <laughs> OK, so uh, she, she really put that together last night and then a, an update this morning. So it's hot off the press, so to speak. All right, well, that was an interesting exercise. Uh, I think like most buffets, you go there and you just take in a lot more than you have room for. <laughs> but uh, it's good to, we have this chance 
that since we're all living in isolation here to get together at least this way. And it's pretty amazing what the Emeriti faculty are doing out there. All right. So I think we'll bring this to a close. See you all in November. Come to Joel's lecture and we'll have 12 November will be our uh, Lindy Dean and In Inca Rock Art. So long, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Barry. Okay. Bye, Barry. To all the speakers. Thank you.